Today on the Modern Motherhood Podcast, I'm your host, Julie Lyles Carr, and just a few short years ago, I don't think she ever could have imagined that something she started just kind of on a whim, just out of a place of really wanting to do something to help somebody, could have led to what it is today. My guest today is the founder of the Noonday Collection, and her name is Jessica Honiger. Jessica, thank you so much for being with us. I'm really looking forward to chatting today. So tell us all the things about yourself, just where you're living, the kids, the hubby, all the things. All the things. So I live in Austin. I've been in Austin since basically since I graduated from UT here in Austin, fell in love with the town. I have three kids, one in middle school that's a girl and two little boys that are in elementary school. I've been married to my husband for about 16 years and I met him when we were overseas with food for the hungry. So met him when we were in the training to move overseas. And he is a good old Midwestern boy, a Hoosier from Indiana. And I've completely converted him to be Texan. He even (laughs) has cowboy boots. Look at you, the powers of persuasion. Full conversion have happened. And I live really close to where I work. Noonday offices are right by my house and have managed to really keep a a pretty simple life (laughs) when you think about everything else that's going on. (laughs) All the things, all the things. And you have said that you've got a mama and a grandmother who, who taught you all the things about fashion and style and all of that. And you adored all of that in your early teen years. And then you took a trip, an overseas trip that really changed you. What trip was that? And how did your perspective change when you came back to the States? Yeah. So I, I grew up with a mom who had three sisters and a grandma who everyone loved to shop. So grew up shopping with them. I went through a phase in high school of anti-shopping and that happened after I came home from a trip that I took to Kenya and my parents, God bless them that, you know, this is back in the nineties, not a whole lot of teens were, you know, going off to Africa. So I, I really felt led to go. I think it was the adventure of it. And it wasn't even a youth group trip. It was an adult trip. So I was the only kid on the trip. And I went to Kenya and I remember walking around the slums of Nairobi and one of the Kenyans who was leading us around pointed to a woman running a brightly colored fruit stand. And this Kenyan explained that this woman had received a microcredit loan of about $30. And that loan enabled her to buy fruit, buy everything she needed to start her fruit stand. And now she was earning enough income to support her five kids and to leave her extremely abusive husband. And I remember that image of this woman, this contrast against sort of the shanty town of the slum with her empowering posture, serving fruit to her customers. And I remember that was the first time I thought, wow, a a business could really change the world. Mm -hmm. And while I can't say my path was straight after that, After I looked back, I remembered that was something that really stuck with me as I began to explore how to have an impact on poverty around the world. So it's interesting that you were in an anti-shopping phase at the time you went to Africa, and yet your company's all about (laughs) shopping. And I am the proud owner of several of your company's products. So tell us about what Noonday is how the genesis of that began, and how this combination of having a very missional spirit, you know, because I think our listeners can just hear that in you. I mean, this seems like really good news to me that you can be missional and change the world and it involves accessories and shopping. So so tell us about Noonday. Yes, I, you know, I think that when we can embrace paradox, it frees us from paralysis. Mm. And I think in high school, after coming back from Kenya, I was like the most judgmental, obnoxious teen. You can imagine it was like, put down that designer bag. There are people dying in Africa. (laughs) But actually living that way, it does not enable you to really walk in the fullness of what God has that God doesn't you know, scorn the rich or glorify the poor really is about embracing the both and. And that really is what Noonday Collection does. So Noonday Collection started about eight years ago, and it really started from a place of financial need. My husband and I had decided to adopt. So we continued to have this missional stream. Like I said, we met overseas and really wanted to grow our 
family through adoption. But at the time when we decided to adopt, we were working in real estate. And we had a little nest egg and we thought, okay, we're going to pursue international adoption, even though it costs money, but we are, uh, we're okay. We've, we've got the money for it. Well, soon the financial recession hit America and eventually caught up to Austin. And we were soon living off that nest egg and soon we were putting groceries on the credit card. And so I knew I needed to start a side hustle. And I'd previously been in contact with some friends of mine living in Uganda who had offered this opportunity to me of, hey, we've, we've, we're partnering with artisans here. We just need someone to create a marketplace in America. Well, I had completely blown them off at the time. And then suddenly when desperation comes knocking, I remember that conversation uh -huh. and I thought, okay, I actually, because I felt like courage cornered me, I needed to do something. I wasn't going to let finances stop us from growing our family through adoption so I called my friends back up. They were still living in Uganda. They said, absolutely, we have all of these products made. We're, they're simply sitting in storage in America. Why don't you sell them? Why don't you see if you can give this a go? And so with trembling hands, I typed out that Evite and invited women into my home. I was so afraid of how I was going to be perceived that they were going to see all of our cards. Yep. We are financially desperate. <laughs> um, I was afraid no one was going to come because I think as women, we're all afraid no one's going to show up for our party. We have this fear of rejection. But instead of letting that fear paralyze me, I just simply went scared. And that one night of refusing to let fear sideline me is what launched what is now Noonday Collection, which was named by Inc. as one of the fastest growing businesses in the country three years ago. So it really did grow from financial need, desperation, mm -hmm. shaky courage legs to saying yes, and then just keep saying one scary yes in front of the other. And I think that's what really inspired me to write this book is that I think oftentimes we compare our beginnings to someone else's middle or someone else's ending without realizing it just started from a small shaky yes. You know, right. normally when we are beginning to step into those things that we're called to do, stepping through our fear into our purpose. It feels scary, but we simply go. And that really is what courage is. I think we do have that tendency to assume when we look at other people that they had it all figured out before they took that first step. And because we don't feel like we've got it all figured out, <laughs> then maybe we shouldn't take that step. Exactly. But I love that phrase, courage cornered me. That's sheer poetry, girl. And I think it's so powerful because a lot of times we find courage when we hit that place that we got to do something. And yeah. it's amazing to me that Noonday Collection has grown the way it has in eight years. I mean, there are people who would say, well, that's a super fast, that seems fast for a business. Yeah. But what have been some of the bumps and things that you've had to learn along the way? I, Our pastor always says that, you know, we, we build planes while we're flying them, which yeah. sounds very counterintuitive. <laughs> but for a lot of entrepreneurs, I know that that really is their story. That so is the story. how was it for you? And what has this eight years been like since that initial launch? Yeah, I will say that we did grow really quickly at, at the beginning, you know, in those first few years, I mean, landing on Inks List was huge. But ironically, quickly after landing on Inc.'s fastest growing company list, we didn't project correctly our inventory. We thought we were going to just keep growing at this triple digit rate. And so we at one point were sitting on an excess of a million dollars of inventory at one point, mm. which is a really... Um, not it's not uncommon for retail companies, but since we partner with artisans and creating a flourishing world through handmade goods, we really were stuck in a hard place of wanting to continue to work with our artisans to drive consistent orders um, while also trying to dig our way out of this inventory hole. So at that point, we were able to get a line of credit from a bank, and then we were actually able to pre-order inventory so artis artisans could continue to have consistent orders. And then we just began to put a lot of products on sale. Yeah. And a lot of that happened because we introduced change. So we are a direct sales model. We have around 2000 women around the country who are our social entrepreneurs. And I think every organization goes through there's the S curve, right? Mm -hmm. So we started really small. And sometimes when you start small, and these women are very much um, 
hitting the pavement for you and they're feeling very entrepreneurial, but then there comes a point of, okay, are we going to stick with this? Are we going to really commit to the long haul view? And we had introduced some change in our commission structure actually in order to make it more of a viable income. But a lot of our ambassadors has, had thought, well, this is more of my side hustle. This is like a volunteer thing. I don't, this really isn't about income for me. And so we lost some of our ambassadors at that point, which then is what slowed our growth. So I think what I really learned over the last eight years is I'm someone who's very apt for change. I'm definitely a starter. I'm not afraid of change, but most people <laughs> don't Aren't embrace Aren't too change. crazy about it, yeah. <laughs> they, they are not crazy about change. So we learned so much through that situation, but when I was in it, I, I was flying that plane, and honestly, I spent a lot of time at the exit door. I abandoned my pilot <laughs> seat, <laughs> and I strapped on my parachute, and I spent a lot of energy looking out that exit door going, I just want to jump. Like It was fine when things were growing fast and we were changing the world, but when things got hard and suddenly many people in our community were questioning our leadership, that's when I thought, man, this is too hard. I want to jump. And I remember someone telling me in the middle of that time, and it was a friend of mine who works for a really large consultant company who consults with Whole Foods and huge organizations. And he looked at me in the eyes and he said, Jessica, you have to take the long view. Mm. And I think as an entrepreneur who had started something to a lot of success and praise, I hadn't really thought, oh, I'm going to commit to this for the long haul. Like the parachute isn't an option. The exit door is never going to open. I just need to sit in the pilot seat that I've been given and continue to fly this plane through the turbulence. I know the destination that I'm going. That had been clear from the beginning. At Noonday, we want to build a flourishing world where children are cherished, where women are empowered, where people have dignified work and places where that is very hard to come by. And where together we are all connected, rich and poor alike. That is the vision. Was I going to let some turbulence have me abandon that vision? And the answer was no. The answer was this, I'm going to fly the plane. Mm -hmm. And that is actually the year that I also decided to go ahead and start writing the book. So I was in the middle of a book, writing a book <laughs> and writing the proposal. And, and I remember calling my agent and saying, what if the book ends and Noonday is shut down? Like, yeah. <laughs> is that, I mean, are it's not really the fairy tale ending. No, no. Like, are publishers still going to want to buy this? Yeah. You know, and, I think I also was just so bent on this outcome. And I think we can often let fear keep us seated when we attach our identity to the outcome. And we often want to be able to predict 100% success, but that, that's really not being vulnerable. That's not really not choosing courage. Choosing courage is being able to walk through fear without knowing exactly what the outcome is. And I know for me, I'm able to walk through my fear because I know who holds my outcome. Mm -hmm. And we are, we are convinced that, you know what, we aren't going to know what the outcome is. We might call that friend and say, hey, this really hurt me. And she might say, you know what, this friendship isn't for me. We might apply for that dream job and go for the interview and might not get it. We might start that company that actually doesn't end up turning a profit. We don't know what the outcome is, but we know who holds the outcome. And I think when we're able to, to embrace that, then we are able to walk through our fears into the life of purpose that we're meant to live. Because I say, I'm going to get to my life and I'd rather look back and say, I died trying and saying, I died just trying to do nothing at all. I died safe. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Okay. I mean, yeah. really, but were you really safe? Right, you know, right. We'll be right back with our conversation with Jessica Honecker. And I want you to be able to also make the difference in the lives of someone across the world. And that you can do, my friend, very simply with Compassion International. I didn't know. I didn't realize that while I was waiting for a convenient time to remember to get online and sponsor a child in need at Compassion International, it meant that that child was having to wait, waiting to be sponsored, waiting for a family who would make sure he would receive medical, educational, and spiritual care. Don't make a child in need wait while you wait for a convenient time. 
It only takes a couple of minutes and just over a dollar a day when you go to Compassion.com slash AllMomDoes to sponsor a child in need who is waiting for you. Well, in your new book, Imperfect Courage, you detail your own journey of having to embrace courage. And I, I love, I think it's going to be such an encouragement for listeners to know that you've stood at the exit door of a plane that you <laughs> took off in and went, I don't know if I want to stay. I think that's really going to be amazing for people to understand that it takes courage to stay in the seat. Yes, it, it takes courage to know when to get out, but it takes a lot of courage to stay when you're not exactly sure what the outcome is going to be. And I was really fascinated by this as you begin to take readers on this journey of embracing imperfect courage. You talk about wanting to, first of all, help people get free from shame. So mm. what is that correlation of how shame can keep us from operating in courage, and what has been the shame dialogue that you've sought freedom from? Yes. Well, I think our biggest obstacle to our success and to our courage is us. It is those inner voices that are inside of us that are telling, you know, we have these fears, but what is the narrative that we are going to choose to confirm? Because we have these fears that say, you're not enough. You know, for me, it was, you're a curvy girl. What are you doing trying to start a fashion brand? You are a mom of small children and you just adopted a kid. What are you doing being the founder and CEO of a startup? You can't both be a good mom and a good CEO. I thought, what am I doing starting a business when I actually don't even have a business background? I should be going and getting an MBA instead. So I had all of these narratives in my head that are, was a should story. Well, this can't be because I should be this. And it was really in being able to identify those voices, which for me are shame. I think shame is that voice that is keeping you seated, keeping you isolated, keeping you in the dark. And I think the way we can walk through that shame is by actually saying it out loud, which is practicing vulnerability. When we have a safe person in our lives, whether it's a friend, a spouse, a parent, a pastor, whatever it might be, when we can actually have that courage to say out loud what that lie is that we're believing, I think that's when we really, that lie loses its power over our lives because we receive that powerful me too. We receive empathy in exchange for our vulnerability. And then those lies, those narratives in our head, we, we begin to confirm a different narrative. You know, I think when we're sitting alone in our head with our fears, we're, tr we're confirming like, I'm just going to fail. I'm going to try and I'm going to fail. Or I'm going to try and I'm going to succeed and then friends are going to leave me or I won't be able to handle the success or I'm going to try and then I'm, you know, people are going to think all sorts of things about me. I, we just have so many narratives that are in our head and I think we have to get those, speak those out loud in order to actually hear them and then we can confirm a different bias. Like, you know what, I'm going to try and Maybe I'm going to fly. Yeah, it could and, happen. <laughs> you know, I'm going to open my home for women and maybe the whole house is going to be filled and I'm going to completely sell out of product because that's what happened to me. You know, maybe I'm going to start a business and it's going to make it to the ink list someday. You know, I think we've got to start speaking to ourselves in those terms of confirming a bias of success, confirming a bias of I am enough. I have everything that I need for today to do what I'm called to do. I know there's so many days where I wake up and I'm like, I'm already waking up late. I'm already going to be late to that meeting. I don't, didn't have enough time to exercise today. It's like we're already waking up with this scarcity mentality. But instead, we can wake up and choose to believe I have everything I need for this moment right now now. And I think when we choose to walk in that abundance mentality, that is what can really cause shame to flee. You know, I think it's interesting you bring up a poverty mentality since in a very tangible way, that's what the New Day Collection is seeking to help overcome in terms of, you know, resources that women in other countries are, are scrambling to try to receive and helping them build their lives through building businesses. But I keep finding in my work with women in this country, in a country that you well know because of your travels, we've got a gajillions and plenty of resources. I mean, I can't remember the stat, but if you've got, if you've even got a refrigerator in your house, you are in the top percentage of the world's population. Yeah, in I think it's like top 4%. Yeah, something like that. And yet 
I keep finding a scarcity mentality that has a whole lot more to do with the heart. And so what have you learned by going into these other countries that maybe as Westerners, we might take just a visual snapshot and say, oh, they're so impoverished, but we don't realize at times that we're operating ourselves out of a heart scarcity mentality in what we say to ourselves, in how we limit ourselves, and in how we keep our vision much more sheltered and shuttered than Mm. maybe what we're being called to do. Yeah, I think that for me, I have really learned this idea of abundance and having a collaborative spirit. I don't want to glorify the poor at all. Poverty is hard. And I don't want to say, oh, when I go to Africa, people are so poor, but people are so happy. Um, I think that we do a disservice when we have that mentality. But I I can say that what I've learned from my friends that live in these more resource poor areas of the world is there is this sense of interconnectedness and collaboration. I remember visiting Guatemala a few years after my husband and I had moved back from Guatemala and I was standing at a hut and there were about 10 different neighbor women all together making the tortillas and there was a two-year-old little girl in the little hut and I could never figure out who her mom was because she was being passed around to every woman in that hut Mm -hmm. and there really is that sense of it's we. And I remember becoming a mom for the first time was one of the most isolating times I'd ever experienced because I was just in my house alone and our neighbors didn't really know each other. And I'm just parenting by myself. And that had been so different from what I had experienced when I'd lived overseas. And, you know, so I think really that was one of the first times I realized, wow, there is such a we mentality in some of these other communities around the world. And then my friends in Uganda, Jalia, who her story really parallels mine. And I talk about her story so much in my book, Imperfect Courage. And Jalia is a dear sister. She was the first artisan. So when I told you that we were given this product from Uganda, and I opened my home that night for all of these women that actually did in fact show up for me. (laughs) Um, Jalia was that first artisan partner and she now has a hundred full-time employees eight years later. Um, And walking with Jalia, she and I have had very similar stories where she felt like not enough. She thought, how can I be running a business? I come from poverty. Um, But the way she has led her thriving business um, in the spirit of collaboration, creating a culture of collaboration has really influenced me. I remember one woman, Nakato, one of her artisans, she um, was thrown out of her home. Uganda, there are not many rights for women. And oftentimes a woman could get thrown out of her home by the husband who might have multiple wives. And she suddenly has no rights to her home or to any of the items in her home. So this woman had three children was kicked out because the husband had found another wife and she shows up at work that day, literally destitute, doesn't have anything. And all of these artisans came together. And by the end of the day, that she had enough rent to cover a new place to go live. She had um, a spoon, a fork, a mosquito net, a cup, a plate. And all of these artisans had come around. And, it, and you know, these aren't artisans who are making a ton of money, but they came, they came together with what little they had in order to rally around their sister. And I, there's, I have stories like that over and over and over again that I write about in my book because we do have so much to learn from our sisters. I think in America, we're so apt to stay isolated. We don't want to reach out for help. So that gives some women the highs, the idea of saying, I'm feeling really alone today. I'm swimming in diapers and you know groceries, and I feel like I haven't done anything that contributes to society or whatever. There's things that we that we can often feel. And instead of reaching out for help, we scroll on Instagram and compare ourselves and think we're the only ones instead of just getting on the phone and saying, and practicing vulnerability and saying help, or those of us that are starting things, whether it's a a nonprofit or a business or a, a woman's retreat, whatever it might be, we think, well, it's all on us instead of 
saying, you know what, I'm weak in this area. I'm just going to own that. You were really strong in this area. Could you help me? I mean, that's what I would love to challenge listeners to do today is could you actually say that phrase to someone? Can you help me with Mm -hmm, this? mm -hmm. We're so afraid to position ourselves in this place of help. And yet that's, that's how Noonday exists. It only exists because women came together for me. And I think I was in such a desperate place that I, at that point I had to ask for help. I had no choice. I had to ask for help. But asking for help and practicing courage enable, has enabled that to be more of a normal part of my lifestyle now. You know, it sounds to me that you're saying the courage to be weak. And I think that's something that yeah. we don't correlate. That's a paradox. Again, to go back to your gorgeous phrase, embracing paradox frees us from paralysis. Yes, bringing a can-do spirit and abundance mentality to what we're called to do, while at the same time, and I think it's a discipline, the exercise of vulnerability, that discipline of saying, I need some help. I can't do this on my own. I know we can do it, but I know that we factor is what's going to bring it to bear. Now, you know, I think one thing that's really fascinating to me, and when you talk about Jalia, am I pronouncing it correctly, Jalia? Yes. Okay. Wanted to get it right. Um, One of the things that I think is really fascinating is that this was an artisan who was already creating. And it's something that Mm -hmm. you became introduced to and got to tap into. It wasn't something that you brought some kind of concept to them. Hey, I need you to build me a thing of Bob. Bob. (laughs) You know, you, you, you you walked into a creative process that was happening. And you've talked about that in your travels, you find women all across the globe who are consistently in the practice of making beautiful things and Mm -hmm. taking bits and pieces that they find and crafting it into something. What does that say to you about women about our desire for beauty for individuality for the repurposing of things that we find in our worlds that's not just a a western thing that that is something that we find that's global in god's daughters Mm -hmm. yeah i really do believe that each of us is created in the image of god every human being and when i think about god and how he initiated the world he created it he was a creator himself he was this architect He was um, this parent. He was this entrepreneur. And literally, um, he asked us to come alongside him. Adam and Eve and said, hey, will you name the trees for me? Will you uh, name the plants? And let's do this together. And I think that when we are walking in our image bearing identity, ultimately, we are called to create. Now, that doesn't mean that we're all called to craft necklaces. I actually am horrible at art, <laughs> like all of that, you know. But I think it really is that innovative spirit, that creative spirit that truly is present in every human being around the world. And when I see that being exercised, whether it's from the slums of Nairobi, which it's amazing, we now work in the slums of Nairobi, which God has done such a full circle um, picture there. We're now creating opportunity for some of those very people that awoke me up to what I could do when I was 15 years old. And whether it's from the slums of Nairobi or to the villages of Guatemala, when I see people living into their image bearing identity, it does have to do with using their gifts to bring something that has not been into what is. And that could be, you know, coming up with a great pizza recipe. I mean, you know what I mean? Like, right, there, right. like there's something very satisfying when you look in the fridge, you're like, I don't know what the plans are tonight, but then somehow you pull off an awesome dinner. I mean, I think that's like an, an example of how we are really meant to take what isn't and and partner with God to create something new. How have you managed, because, you know, the work that you do, and for anyone who's engaged in missional work, in work that involves the lives and outcomes for other people, how do you manage what has got to feel like intense pressure for the responsibility of these 4,500 artisans that you now have who all contribute into Noonday Collection? How do you handle that? Because I know for some of us, just trying to make sure we're making sure the kids are okay and we've kind of covered some basic stuff at work and and yeah, we've you know fed the husband a good meal every now and then. The idea of having that kind of a population that it's not like, oh, well, you know, If it doesn't work out with that artisan, she can always go find another accounting job somewhere else. I mean, you know, this is this is really intensely tied to their livelihoods. Yeah. How do you balance all that? You know, I would say 
and I'm definitely a work in process. I would say when I start feeling the weight and the responsibility of this whole idea of linked prosperity, I, I do go back to the garden. That brings me a lot of vision. And in the garden, what happened is when shame entered the picture, Adam and Eve went and hid. And they decided, you know what, we're going to go off and do this on our own. We're going to sew our own clothes. We're going to have to take care of ourselves. We're going to have to be self-sufficient. And that definitely can be my my temptation as well is I got to, I got to work 24 seven. I got to hustle as hard as I can. I got to say yes to everything. I can justify not having boundaries because I'm like the work I'm doing matters so much. But in fact, if you look back into that story, God comes looking for Adam and Eve and he says, where are you? Like, like, where'd you go? Let's do this together. And so what I, um, how I'm able to kind of walk in peace and joy in doing work that is very justice oriented and is a high stakes job. It's when I'm really walking in partnership with God and I'm realizing I'm not alone in this. I'm not bearing the weight of this. Um, God, in fact, does care more. And I think when I'm able to really let God shoulder the weight and really know that my life is just offering and I'm just gift and my job is just to show up. My job is to show up be faithful, do what I meant to do and not waste my time and energy on comparison or trying to outshine anyone. Just shine, just be exactly what I meant to do this day, walk in that faithfulness. And, um, I wish I could, <laughs> I wish I could say I do that on a daily basis. <laughs> Uh, you know, a little bit of hand wringing every now and then, you know? <laughs> yeah, but I do. I picture very clearly in my head often, like frequently, you know, I'm like hiding in the forest and I hear God just kind of looking for me. And it's not with a pointing finger. It's not with a yelling voice. It's like, girl, I'm missing you. Let's do this together. Remember? Like, it's you and me, girl. Like, come on, you know? Mm -hmm. And when I imagine that, I feel a lot of, of peace and joy restored. You know, when my daughter and I started our nonprofit to Dance to Dream, which provides dance and performance opportunities for individuals with special needs, uh -huh. we knew that we were really going to be serving the special needs population. We're very excited about that. And, and that gets a lot of attention. What we hadn't anticipated was the change, I mean, the revolution that would be created amongst a lot of our volunteers, those who were buddying up with our dancers with special needs. And mm -hmm. we've had different volunteers end up going back and getting their degrees in physical therapy or finding that, you know, mm -hmm. they were absolutely called to be a special ed teacher or whatever the thing was. You know, we focus a lot with the Noonday Collection on how it's changing the lives of women across the globe, these artisans who are now resourced and and building, you know, teams of their own. Mm -hmm. But what are some of the stories that you've discovered through those people who have come alongside as ambassadors here in the States? And how do you balance in a more competitive Western environment and people wanting to build their own business and be an entrepreneur, that collaborative spirit that's become so important to you in your travels across mm -hmm. the globe? How does all yes. that mesh for you? So our ambassadors are our social entrepreneurs, and these are the women who are running their own businesses. They're growing organizations now. I'm so happy to say that back in 2015, when we said, hey, we want you guys to earn more money, and the women that were like, what? That, you know, we fully made the switch. So income and impact, and I'm so proud to say that women here in America are earning viable incomes while also making an impact. It's a paycheck with purpose. And... I do get a little flack sometimes because women are like, you're, you're all about collaboration and we should run at our own pace and run our own race. But then we have a huge conference every year and you celebrate the top sellers. And I'm like, you know what? We're celebrating these women. And by putting them on the stage, it's not taking away from anything that you've done. So it really is about celebrating her success and realizing that doesn't diminish your own. Mm -hmm. And I think the more we celebrate one another and truly that is what can rob that scarcity spirit in our hearts. Like if you're dealing with a spirit of scarcity or the kind of competitive nature that's actually wanting you to put other people down choose celebration, choose someone to celebrate today. And I think that is really the antidote to that, comp like the more of the competitive spirit that comes from a scarcity mentality. And I've just seen so many women step into their stories. I mean, we've had 
women who have become social entrepreneurs and they've been able to provide extra therapy classes for maybe their children with special needs. What's one of my favorite moments was taking some, uh, an ambassador to Guatemala. We take our women overseas every year. We took about 150 women last year and one woman met an, a Guatemalan artisan who had a child with special needs and this ambassador also had a child with special needs and this ambassador was able to look this artisan in the eyes and say thank you so much because of your work I've been able Mm. to provide extra support to my child with special needs. Wow, wow. And that's the power of collaboration. That's the power of going together. That's the power of linked prosperity. You know, I, I, Courage cornered me originally that night and now Courage corners me every day because my future and my success is linked with thousands of women's success. And so when we choose to go together and not go alone and we link our future with others, that does make it a lot easier to commit to that long haul view and say, well, you know what? I can't jump off this plane because if I abandon ship, then a lot of other people are going to be affected by that. Mm-hmm. And that's been um, such a huge mind shift for me. But it's amazing to me that the ambassadors here in America, like their life change, honestly, is is sometimes just as significant as Nakato, the woman I told you about earlier, who was kicked out of her home, but then restored by her community. Um, we have ambassadors who maybe have had bad experiences with women in the past, or, you know, all they remember is middle school lunch table. Right, right. Brutal, brutal place. (laughs) Brutal place, but becoming part of our community and really choosing the sisterhood way has really restored um, their view of sisterhood and it has enabled them. It just really um, has unleashed and catalyzed courage in so many women across America. I'm so proud of our community. It's one of the things that makes me most proud and also gives, I mean, I have so much fun getting to do it with so many other women who are saying, Jessica, you're not alone. We're with you. We're shouldering this with you. I love that. Now, you've been on book tour for this baby book of yours, Imperfect Courage, Live a Life of Purpose by Leaving Comfort and Going Scared. So I'm going to have to add another title since you've been traveling so much on book tour. And of course, you're across the globe all the time. I'm going to call you a premier female social scientist. You're getting to encounter all kinds of women in all kinds of walks of life. So what are some common themes you notice in the lives of women today? How does geography play a role? And what do you think is familiar for women, regardless of where they're living? I love that. I will claim that. I will totally claim that. You're good. You're good. I, that, that's, a, that's completely new to me, that one. Yeah, I do feel like I get this front row seat to seeing that we are more alike than we are different. And at Noonday, we really celebrate beauty. I mean, we have trunk shows where women come into other women's homes and we try on jewelry and we celebrate beauty. And I've been able to see that across the globe when I first met Jolia. She wouldn't wear any makeup and she was wearing the same clothes every single day. And I remember when we were doing our first little photo shoot together, this is about a year into noonday and her starting her business. And she saw me putting on lipstick and she's like, can I borrow some? And I said, sure. And so she put on that lipstick and she just started standing a little taller. And she told me later that once she really owned her worth, she started dressing differently and she started putting on makeup and now when you go to Uganda and visit her artisans all everyone's wearing red lipstick <laughs> when I first went to the workshop for the very first time it wasn't even a workshop honestly at the time it's just a handful of of a few people and um, the hair hair was very simple it was often cut short because it costs money to maintain a weave and then I remember just two years after that going and seeing these beautiful weaves and women having like some purple braids and some red buns and I remember feeling so satisfied because you know, women all over the world, we want to feel beautiful. And if I I feel great after getting a hair highlight, why shouldn't a woman in Uganda be able to go get a beautiful weave too? Mm -hmm. And I, so I think there's this idea of being able to celebrate beauty, even though that looks different in every single culture. I see that every woman has this sense of style and the sense of wanting to honor her worth by also owning her style. I also get the sense that you know, this, this voice of shame, this feeling of I'm not enough or I'm too much. I've seen that present. So really, um, unleashing women around the world to own their voice and to stand up. And of course, in countries like India, I mean, India scores really low on the, uh, 
human rights index. Um, but oh my goodness, I feel like I, I've, what I've seen firsthand is, is women have gained economic empowerment through their jobs. They now have a voice in their home. And even I've met women who were formerly being abused by their husbands, which is, is honestly and sadly commonplace in India. Now that they have economic empowerment, they have that confidence to stand up to their husband, to work through that with their husband, to know their rights as women, that actually this isn't, it might be a cultural norm, but we're going to change that cultural norm. So I've also seen just that we all have that desire to, to contribute to our families, you know, whether that's through financial contribution or just being able to support our family in another way. We all have this desire to see our families flourish. I've, I've absolutely seen that. And we all deal with uh, those voices. <laughs> so it really is about being able to own our worth and really be that that sun and that song that we're meant to be in the world. Beautiful. So many of the things that you're doing, you just really know how to tap into the hearts and souls of women and speak courage to them, speak empowerment, whether they're here in the U.S. or across the globe. So thank you so much for all that you are doing for today's women. Thank you. You can connect with Jessica. Her favorite is Instagram. Why don't you head over there? She's Jessica Honegger on Instagram, and you spell Honegger, H-O-N-E-G-G-E-R. That's Jessica Honegger. I'd love to connect with you, too, at JulieLylesCar.com and on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, all the places as Julie Lyles Car. Also, check out AllMomDoes.com. That's the blog. There's all kinds of fantastic information and inspiration there and all mom does on all the socials. Be sure and check it out as well because you're going to find a wealth of encouragement and inspiration for everything in your mom journey. A big shout out to Donna Toady. She is our producer and to Rebecca Beckett, our content coordinator. They're the ones who make sure that every week this podcast gets edited and posted and goes to all the places it's supposed to. Be sure and subscribe and we would love it if you would leave us a five-star review and a comment. It helps others find the podcast. And so we'd be honored if you take just a minute and do that for us. Well, coming up next week, she has a really exciting ministry that is of such help to moms who have daughters. She has a fascinating story, and I just can't wait for you to hear our conversation. Next week, we welcome to the Modern Motherhood Podcast, Dana Gresh. I'll see you then. (laughs) 